Hi guys, so today we'll talk about Ethereum, um, which is another very popular blockchain. Probably the two most known ones are Bitcoin and Ethereum with everything else uh, kind of in the distance. So um, we looked at two kind of foundational white papers about Ethereum um, and let's try to get into the details of it. So. Uh, the first thing is motivation. So what problem is Ethereum trying to solve, right? Or what is the motivation of why we needed another type of blockchain beyond what was already available in Bitcoin? Um, basically, the focus was on um, transaction-based state machines. So while Bitcoin just allows you to transfer money, um, though there is some uh, a little bit of limited scripting in it, um, the focus of Ethereum was to divine, devise a system where you can have some state um, and then you can change that state through a set of transactions. Right? So if you think about it, that's actually a pretty generic programming model um, where you have some state on the server, then you have some transactions coming in or some messages coming in, even if it's like a multiplayer game. And then based on that, if it's, I don't know, first person shooter game, you figure out who was hit, who was not hit. And based on, the, on that, you update their live or you update their points and that's your new state, okay? Um, they also wanted to build it from the ground up as a software development platform. So there was this immediate focus on developers right from the start, okay? So um, as I mentioned, there was some amount of scripting available in Bitcoin. And the idea was there that you could put a bit more complex input data to kind of solve a puzzle that, a puzzle that would authenticate a transaction. Um, the problem with that is that there was no loops, no storage, or and no randomness in this, right? And um, you need loops, you need some control statements to have loops. That's kind of a general thing about uh, Turing complete machines. You also need storage that persists beyond just the execution of one code. Without storage, you can have a state machine because there's no state to save. And then you also need randomness. It's kind of a weird thing, but without randomness, many things are actually impossible. And so um, there needs to be some way to introduce randomness in a way that can be game, gamed by people, okay? So uh, Ethereum smart contracts provide you two things. It, they do provide you storage. Okay? So each smart contract can have some sort of storage that carries from one invocation of the smart contract to another. And then you also have Turing complete set of operations. Operations and ways to introduce uh, randomness. Okay, um, the general idea behind this too is that uh, code is law. So you define those smart contracts between and parties can kind of engage in them. Uh, maybe the way to engage is to deposit some cryptocurrency into a smart contract account. Uh, thereby now you have some cryptocurrency at stake and you're participating. Right, and then whatever is written into the contract is the law of how this contract is executed. There's no taking it to court, it's just what it is. And 
you know, this is great too because no one can mock with the code, but at the same time, it can be bad if there's some bug in the code that gets discovered later. And there indeed was such an instance um, in Ethereum um, where someone was able to hack and siphon off a lot of Ethereum. Um, and then as a result of that, we got the split between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. So in Ethereum Classic, um, the miners decided to not honor the return of the money uh, to kind of, um, you know, cancel out the hack, whereas in Ethereum people did, and that's how the community split. So that was kind of a big controversial thing. So code is law until the entire community gets uh, taken advantage of, and then you get a split in the chain. So, but anyway, that was the idea. Code being law was the original idea. Okay, so let's talk about uh, state transitions a bit more formally. All right, so we're going to have some state. Let's say we're going to say this is a sigma at time t. Okay, and then we're going to add some transaction to it. Okay. And then maybe we have some operation gamma underneath that uh, as a result of that transaction. And that will result in our state at time t plus 1. Okay, So you can think of sigma t being some state. Okay, And then you can get to some other state, sigma t plus 1, through some transaction t okay um, and so you're basically moving between these different states it's possible that some other transaction i don't know t prime gets you back to the original state or to a new state that's equivalent to the original state you can look at it in different ways right so state transition diagrams are often used in terms of uh, defining protocol operation where you have a finite number of states such as for example for tcp um, but you can also think of really any program as just transitioning between a set of states. And if it's a sequential program, you can think of the transition as kind of just a chain of states where you execute a command and you move to a new state. Um, but often you have protocols that, that do operate on a finite set of states. Um, so um, the way this is done in Ethereum is that there's many different uh, states because each state corresponds to a particular to a particular smart contract, and so a block will contain many transactions. Okay. And each of those transactions moves some smart contract from one state to another, right? Or if, if they're not smart contract invocations, the state of accounts from um, one state to another. All right, so if you're getting a block as a miner, and it can, or if you're trying to form a block from a set of transactions, you can't really execute those transactions in parallel, right? Because potentially each transaction move this, moves the state that the last transaction left it in, okay? So when mining a block, you need to apply the transactions in sequence um, because you can't move the state into different directions, right? The transactions need to be sequential, which, kind of really goes back to the stuff we discussed in transactions where uh, there needs to be a certain order to them and you can interleave their operations as long as you get serializable execution, right? So uh, in Ethereum, the way to do this is to simply execute one transaction after another until you have the results and then the results of that can be written into the block. Um, so, yeah. Um, the other question that you could ask is, how can you um, disseminate these transactions? Okay. So in fact, transactions are disseminated over Kadimlia. So we talked about distributed hash tables. Kademlia was one of them. And so all the miners in 
um, in the Ethereum network are connected with each other using the Kadimne overlay. And so let's say you submit a transaction to one miner. Well, maybe that miner, that miner will be able to include the transaction to a block, but um, that transaction or that miner disseminates that transaction to other miners through this overlay such that that transaction has a chance of being included in the next block produced by many different miners. How do the miners choose which transaction to include? Well, it's basically based on the price each transaction is willing to pay, and I'll come back to that in a second. Okay. Um, one other thing you could wonder about is how to interact with outside state. And so let's say that you have a smart contract that places a bet on what the weather is going to be tomorrow. All right. So I say it's going to be over 50 degrees. You say it's going to be below 50 degrees. Great. So today we can uh, put a stake into or our bet into a smart contract and say we all, you know, both of us stake an Ethereum coin. And then tomorrow that smart contract can look at the weather report and see who was right, whether the weather was over or under 50 degrees during the day on average or maximum or whatever, right? However you define a smart contract. And so the smart contract needs to have the ability to get that information from, from the outside, right? You could have that smart contract contact the server to get that information, but that server could be hacked by me, and so I win the bet. Um, so we need some sort of a trusted way of getting information. And this is where um, oracles come in. Hey. Yikes. Okay, cool. An oracle will be a service that will write real-world information into a smart contract. Um, which then can be accessed by, um, by your smart contract to, um, to kind of figure out what the value was. Okay. So from within your smart contract, you can make a call to an Oracle and then get whatever information um, you need. Okay. Um, so you make a call to another smart contract to get, that, to get that information out. All right. So let's talk about uh, smart contracts in a little bit more detail then. Okay, so a smart contract will be some piece of some piece of code okay. um, and that code will be bytecode uh, compiled for the EVM or Ethereum virtual machine. So um, you can write your smart contract in a language called Solidity. Though there are other languages. And then when you compile that smart contract, it gets compiled into this bytecode and that's what actually gets executed by miners. Um, so to execute um, each operation, uh, it costs some gas. which is some, which is, um, some value. So for example, if you know, you're running like an add addition in your bytecode that might cost some amount of gas versus a multiply might be more expensive and so it'll co cost mo most, uh, more gas. So as you compile your smart contracts into the bytecode, 
then for each operation into the bytecode, there's some price associated with, and then to execute the smart contract or ex executing it, for example, if you have a loop, um, depending on what operations you're invoking, that increases the cost of that smart contract, okay? You also have uh, some storage space. which is a dictionary or a key value store. Okay. Um, storing stuff also costs gas. Okay, so you're paying for each element that you're storing, um, but can also be freed. Okay, so if the execution of your smart contract places more data, um, well, then you need to pay for that, uh, for that extra space you're using, but you can also free some of the locations and then kind of save um, on the state that you're writing, okay? To run a smart contract, you specify a gas price, which is how much Ethereum, you, how many units of Ethereum you're paying for how many units of gas, okay? So let's say that your Smart contract uses five additional operations and each of them costs two gas, okay? So then running your smart contract requires 10 gas. Now, you can say, I'm going to pay one Ethereum pay per one unit of gas, and so now you're paying 10 Ethereum to run your smart contract. Or you can say, I'm gonna pay half an Ethereum for gas, and so now your smart contract would cost less, which co would cost five Ethereum, right? So why would you do that? Well miners will choose the transactions to put into the block based on gas price. So if you're paying more for gas, that means the miner is making more of the fees, right? Because the miner, the first miner that executes the smart contract uh, gets to keep the fees. So if you pay more for gas, your transaction becomes more attractive and it's more likely to be included in the block, right? Of course, you can overpay. You can pay like 100 Ethereum per gas. That's gonna be outrageously expensive. Right, or you can pay a tiny, tiny fraction for of Ethereum for your gas, and then miners can look at that and say, uh, "I'm not interested in ex in executing this because I have other smart contracts that are paying more. I'm going to choose those to put into the new block." Okay, so you kind of got to set that appropriately. You can kind of get a good guess on a good guess on how much gas, how to set your price of gas by consulting a gas price oracle. And those monitor the gas that has been used by previous successful transactions and based on that recommends um, how much gas to use with respect to how quickly you want your transaction to be picked up by the different miners. Um, all right, so a transaction will run or your smart contract transaction. runs until, okay? So one, it could be that until it's finished. Okay. You are, you exceed your gas limit, which is a variable that you set in your transaction just like you would set a gas price. So basically I can say, I'm gonna, I want the smart contract to run until I spend 100 gas. And so you know you're not gonna have to pay more than 100 gas. So if you have some infinite loop in there, there's some bounding on that, right? Or it will run until, I guess I can put it here, finished or error. Okay. So what happens is that because of this, um, transactions can end prematurely. Yeah, this is terrible writing, I'm sorry. Okay. 
So if you run out of gas, if you set the gas limit to low, your uh, transaction could quit in the middle of executing something and potentially end up in bad state. Right? So it's possible that you uh, extracted some information, some money from an account, but then you never deposited it in the, in the other account during a transfer. And now Ethereum or your smart contract is in an inconsistent state. So there's a lot of work being done on how to estimate gas limits to make sure that you, um, uh, that you don't run out of gas in the middle of it and, and don't end up in an inconsistent state. All right, so that's basically smart contracts. Um, mining in Ethereum is also kind of interesting. And it's a little bit different than in other chains where let's say we have the main chain, okay? And then we have a fork, okay? And then this becomes the main chain. Well, the question is what happens to, to this block, all right? And I let's keep switching. I should just close this window. And so what this block is called is actually an uncle. Okay. So it's not on the main chain. It's been a, a fork, but um, the chain kind of recovered quickly. And so you have maybe these blocks that are just kind of hanging off of the main chain. Now, the advantage of these blocks is that this block, let's call it A, let's call it B. Okay still validates block A. So there's a bit of an advantage in terms of security of having uncles because they still testify, they increase the computational power um, that certifies that transactions in A are correct. All right? And so when you create an uncle or you know, if you don't win the race and you're not the first block, um, you can still get some reward for creating the uncle Right? Just like you would get a reward for a new block, but you don't get any reward for the transactions that you included in them. So it's a little bit nicer to miners in the sense that you can still make some money even if you're not the first one. Um, there was also this uh, way of mining Ethereum that kind of prevented it from using ASICs. So you could use GPUs, but not ASICs. Now there are ASICs for Ethereum, so, so you might see this in the literature that ASICs don't really work for Ethereum, or well, now they kind of do. Um, so that's no longer a unique part of Ethereum mining, but, but paying for uncles is. All right. Um, so that's their proof of work idea. Um, and now let's move on to the proof of stake. Next page. There we go. So, um, also known as POS, okay? So the first thing to talk about here is the downsides with proof of work. All right. Um, so the first problem with this is that it takes lots of electricity. How much electricity? Um, actually, it takes more electricity than Ireland. So globally, we spend so much time mining the new blocks, solving the cryptographic puzzles, that all the miners use more, ele more electricity in aggregate than the country of Ireland, which is kind of crazy. Um, it also is the problem of rich getting richer by the economies of scale. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, if let's say I'm a miner and you're a miner and we're starting the proof of work and I win the first block. Okay, great. Now I have more money in my account and so I can buy myself another miner. 
Okay, then we mine the next block and then I have twice the chance of getting the next block. So maybe you win the next block, great, but then I, um, well, I guess now then we're even. <laughs> but over time, if I have more miners and I can, or I get lucky initially and I can start getting more blocks, I can turn those profits into buying myself, to buy myself even more miners and then just keep outracing you and turning the profits into more miners. Right. So that's actually not so bad. That's pretty natural. Um, what happens though is that if this imbalance gets too large, I can not only buy one more miner at a time, I can put an order for like a thousand miners and then get a discount on those. Okay. So not only rich get richer, but I also can use the economy of scale to uh, get even richer. Right. And that's something that's been happening in the mining pools. Um, and so you get these mining pools that are growing so large, they're actually creating a possibility of a 51% attack. All right, so that's something we want to avoid. Um, so under proof of stake, we're not going to actually mine the new blocks. We're simply going to validate them. So now the nodes in the network aren't called miners. They're called validators. All right, so we have a mechanism. Where validators... take some of their ETH. Okay. Um, then validators, let's call them these, um, elect um, who gets to make the next block. And that is based, um, so with probability, proportional to the stake. Okay, so if you have more stake in this network, um, you are more likely to be chosen to create the next block. Now, why would that be a good idea, right? It's, I just talked about the rich get richer problem, but here we have the same situation. The more money you have, um, the, more you, the, the more likely you are to be chosen to create the next block. Um, well, there's really, there's kind of two reasons for it. One, there's really no way around it. Let's say you said that um, you need to stake some minimal amount of ETH or really any amount of ETH, um, but let's call it minimal, right? Because it's a, it's a kind of a discrete resource. And so if I have more ETH, I can just create more miners. And if the probability of who gets to make the next block is random, um, right, or kind of uniform, then if I have more miners, then I get to create uh, new blocks, right? More that I'm more likely to be chosen to select a new block or one of my miners is more likely to be chosen for the next block, um, right? So there's kind of no way around it, but this is also bad because if I have tiny little miners, that means maybe each one of them needs to run on some hardware. And so if I have more money, I get to buy more hardware with economies of scale. And so I'm back where I started with Rich Get Richer through economies of scale, um, the same problem I had in Bitcoin. So if we just said Rich Get Richer or, or if we just select miners based on how much stake they have, then I can just have you know one miner with a lot of stake and I get some proportional presentation based on my stake, um, right? And that's perhaps fine, which is kind of the other reason. People that have stake in the network, people that own Ethereum should be the ones that decide who gets to, like how the Ethereum network gets to move forward, 
right? So uh, kind of giving people with more stake, more governance power, or more ability to validate next blocks actually makes sense, okay? So um, the elected validator makes the next block, or mints, and doesn't get the money for creating a new block, but uh, keeps the transaction fees. Or basically the amount of gas that transactions burn through. Okay. Um, that block is sent to other validators who sign it, who verify and sign it. Okay, so the person, the validator that made the block gets to keep the transaction fees or, or most of them, and then the block is sent to other nodes who validate it, okay? And they also get some of the fees for validation. Basically, they include their stake in vouching for that block, and so, if it's correct, they get their fees. Uh, they get to keep some of the profit from the block. Um, if it's not correct, then they lose the amount of Ethereum that they staked on that block, right? Um, and where does the money go? Well, it just gets slashed. Basically, um, their stake gets uh, marked as in as invalid, and now they can't spend it on anything else or stake it. Okay, so. Um, Let's see, anything else I want to say? No, that's about it. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so there's some problems with this. Okay, so first, validators need to have high enough stake. to cover the transactions. So I can look into the transaction pool um, and I can say, all right, I'm only staking 100 Ethereum, so the amount of money transferred in Ethereum uh, in the block that I'm making has to be less than that, right? Otherwise, I can't cover the losses if there's a double spending event, right? Because I'm, I'm not, that's 100 Ethereum is all I can use, all I'm staking, so I can only cover losses up to 100 Ethereum, right? Um, so if there's a lot of transactions that are more expensive than that, I can't, inc or, you know, that are expensive, I can't include all of them into my block. So I can either choose cheaper transactions or I can choose a smaller number of transactions. But if you're staking like 1,000 Ethereum, well, then you are one more likely to be to create the new block, and then you are more likely to actually make a lot of profit on that block because you can stuff expensive transactions, large expensive transactions in it. Okay, so it kind of penalizes people without a lot of stake in in in, the, in terms of the types of transactions that they can choose. Okay, um, the other problem is that validators can choose not to complete the block. So let's say that I'm chosen as the next validator. I'm supposed to make a block, but then I don't, right? Um, and everyone's waiting for me and I give them nothing and then they need to choose somebody else. There's a backup validator. But to prevent people from doing that, um, I'm also going to lose money or there's a uh, penalty for lack of uptime. Okay. So if I announce myself as a validator, I need to stake some amount of Ethereum onto in, in, into the network. And then if I'm not available to complete the blocks when I'm supposed to, 
or I'm not available to sign the blocks as they are sent to me, I'm going to lose some of that stake. Right? So if I don't want to do that, I need to kind of take myself out of the pool first so that people don't count on me to prevent, uh, to complete some work. All right? um, as far as implementation, there's something called PeerCoin that's already live, that's using um, uh, proof of stake. As far as Ethereum, there are kind of two proposals for it. They're both called Casper, which is kind of confusing. So one is called Casper, uh, the friendly finality widget. And this is going to be the first thing that's implemented in Ethereum. And the idea there is to gradually transition into proof of stake by having every hundredth block be a proof of stake block. And so those proof of stake blocks will basically validate everything that happened before. Um, so that's sort of step one. The second step into this is a, uh, a full proof of stake protocol. And the way this would work is that every block is a proof of stake block. So basically the, the blockchain is correct by construction. What's holding that up is uh, kind of working on incentives, but mostly working on the correctness of the protocol, right? Because once you deploy it, that's kind of it. <laughs> so uh, they're working on correctness proofs for the protocol. And when that's done, they're going to start implementing it. But um, initially they're going ahead with uh, the finality widget implementation. So you kind of see Casper in two different versions. All right, I think that's about, that about covers it at a pretty high level. Um, there's a lot more to Ethereum. Um, I think uh, if I'm lucky, I asked John Paxton to let me teach a full course on Ethereum um, next, uh, not on Ethereum, the full course on blockchains next spring. So this course here will be kind of a prep for that. And then in spring, we'll get to spend probably like a couple of weeks on Ethereum and get into the smart contracts and, and all the other depth of it. So um, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope that gives you enough introduction to get started. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys on Wednesday.